I want to reiterate what Brother Grimaldi mentioned earlier about the 24 hours of prayer. And if you would select a time slot, we are building towards having a continuous prayer chain. And so pray at home, pray in that place if your prayer closet. Uh, if you want to come to the church, we usually have a place available, either the chapel or the sanctuary. Sometimes both are in use, and it does create a little challenge, but uh, there's almost always a place to pray if you do want to come to the church to pray. But really, the, the vision is that wherever you're at, that you would enter your prayer closet, and that 24 hours a day, uh, members of this ministry would be calling upon the name of the Lord for great revival and for, and for great harvest. Everyone said amen. Uh, the first speaker of Landmark this year, uh, Brother Jonathan McDonald, a tremendous friend to our ministry, he, uh, several years ago, I don't know exactly where this position came from, but I was so thankful that he was the man that stepped into that role. Uh, he was the prayer coordinator for the Western District, which is kind of our area of the country, and he started doing something that changed the spiritual atmosphere of, of our district, of this area. He started prayer meetings, and, and they're called sectional prayer meetings, just located in, in different parts. And it was a beautiful time where churches would come together and pray. And I got to thinking about this church. This church is so, um, so powerful in prayer. When this church prays, things happen. And uh, so that just kind of motivated me to kind of make everyone aware that on on Monday evening of this coming week, which is tomorrow, uh, there's going to be one of these prayer meetings in our area. It's going to be in Modesto. And if you, God puts it in your heart to join us, we're going to be, several of us will be there in Modesto praying and just believing for a great revival, not just in Stockton, but all throughout this Central Valley. And a praying church is a powerful church, but when a church prays together in unity, uh, there's something extra powerful about that. So just wanted everyone to be aware of that, that this is Brother McDonald's vision for us to have prayer all throughout this great state. And we can do our part. So that'll be our prayer meeting uh, for this area that we're in. will be Monday night in Modesto at 730. So if you, God puts it in your heart, uh, you are more than welcome to join us for that. The book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Ephesians 5 and 22. The Lord is good. Turn to someone with the Holy Ghost smile. Say, God is good. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband, does someone say amen? Some single Bible college student just said amen. <laughs> you say it loud enough, you're going to stay single. Amen. But we are in the word, young ladies, so let's read that again. Wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as, Christ, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, I'm going to confess those scriptures have nothing to do with my message. I just like reading those verses. Now, verse 25 is, <laughs> gets into what I'm going to minister today. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. This is, this is what Christ did for the church. So, so Paul is using the analogy of the husband and wife relationship, and then he ties it into what Christ has done for the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That, that is God's desire. That is God's plan for the church, that he would present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, she should be holy and without blemish. Beautiful. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. I want to read this one verse from the book of Romans chapter 8. 
And Paul says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Everyone say adoption. Everyone say adoption. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So for a few moments this morning, I want to share this subject with you. God's perfect plan for a perfect church. God's perfect plan for a perfect church. Lord, we love you today. You are so good to us. Thank you that we could gather in your house and experience your presence. Thank you for the joy of salvation. Thank you for peace that surpasses all understanding. Thank you for your goodness to us. There's not a God like you. There's not a God that can compare to you. And God, we offer nothing but thanksgiving for all that you've done for us. Our hearts are filled with gratitude today. We worship you today. We honor you today. We bless you today. Thank you that we get to be in your church, a part of your church. Thank you for all that you're doing in this hour, and we are a part of what you're doing. Thank you for calling us and choosing us and saving us. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. I'm wondering if someone can clap their hands to the Lord this morning. Turn to a different neighbor this time and tell them, hey, God is good. So this morning we're talking about God's perfect plan for a perfect church. And the first thing we must realize is that the plans of God, the plans that he creates are different than what our plan would be. The plans that God, the plans, excuse me, that God comes up with, the plans that he would create, they're different than the plans that we would create. See, he doesn't think like we think. His thoughts and his ways are very different from ours. And we see this in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, where God declares this. He says this about himself. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So first of all, we have to realize, okay, when God creates a plan, his plan is going to look different probably than the plan that you and I would create. You see, if I was God, and thank God I'm not, but if I was God and I was going to build a church that would be responsible to accomplish my mission, if I was going to build a church that would represent me in the world, this is how I would build the church if I was God. I would find the best and the brightest, the strongest, the wisest, the most talented, the ones with the most to offer. I would build my church with those kind of people. But that is the exact opposite of what God has done. When I was 10 years old, I, I grew up the first 10 years of my life in San Jose, California. And you grow up and you go to the same school and you have the same friends and you just kind of figure out your place in life. And when we were 10, we moved from San Jose to the Central Valley, moved to Manteca. Absolute culture shock. Things were so different moving from the, the bustling, busy Bay Area to the Central Valley. And when you step onto a new playground, you show up at a new, new school, nobody knows you. No one knows anything about you. And, and you feel this pressure. Those that have moved during childhood, those that have moved, you understand this. You feel like you have to prove yourself. Like, no, they don't know you. And I, I remember and uh, being short of stature, uh, I felt like I've had to probably prove myself a lot in life. Because people will just dismiss you uh, when, 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 when you're... Short of stature, it's just one of those challenges that, that all of us might have that, that have this situation in life. And so there I am, showing up this new school, and I remember we went out to recess one of the first days I was there, and we all lined up to play Greek dodgeball. Now, if you've never played Greek dodgeball, uh, man, you've missed out on life. 
And I know they have rules now at school where you can't play dodgeball anymore because a kid might get hurt. And you can't throw a ball at someone's head because that's violent, whatever. The way we avoided getting hit in the head back then is we learned how to duck. And uh, the whole goal was to hit someone with that ball as hard as you could. And so we played dodgeball back in San Jose. So I knew how to play dodgeball. And I was good at dodgeball. I'm good at it, man. I, I, I would be one of the ones that would last the longest in the game because, man, I was just shifty and quick, and I could jump around. I could catch the ball. I could throw the ball. I was good. Listen to me. Believe me today. <laughs> so we lined up across the fence, and you know how it goes on the playground. They have the two, the two biggest, strongest, you know, most athletic kids get to be the captains, and they're picking teams, and they're going off. They're going off, and something has happened that is so demoralizing they're picking everyone ahead of me. And it comes down to me and the girl. No, no offense, no offense, young ladies, no offense. But come on. You got to pick me before the girl. Nope, they pick the girl before me. And I know what it feels like to be the last one standing on the fence. I know what it feels like to be the last one picked because nobody believes in you. No one thinks you can do what they need you to do. And when you're the last pick, there's nothing to celebrate. Like everybody else, I got him, I got her, I got him, I got him, I got... When you're the last pick, they're like, come on, you're on my team. <laughs> and it's like the walk of shame. You're just like, horrible, horrible. Why? Because when we pick the team, when you're the captain of the team, you want the strongest, the fastest, you want the best. But that's not how God picks his team. Everyone said amen. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things they are. And here's why God has done it this way. That no flesh should glory in his presence. You see, God knew if he picked the best, the brightest, the strongest, they would try to take the credit. When he used them and when he blessed them and when he anointed them and when he favored them, they would puff their chest out and they would take the credit for all the good in their life because they did it by their talent. They did it by their skill. They did it by their wits. They did it by their intelligence and they would take the credit and God doesn't want that in his church. No flesh should glory in his presence. I'm going to read that again from, from a, a different rendering. This is what it says. Brothers and sisters. Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. See, God purposely chose those considered foolish, those considered weak, those on the bottom of the totem pole, those who are dismissed by everybody else. So, friend, God chose us. I don't mean this in any way like negative, but I just want you to kind of look around this morning. Just look around. Look around at the church that you're a part of. Look around the church that God is building in Stockton. God didn't pick the wealthiest, the most genius, the uber talented. But in his mercy, he picked people like us. And his motive was clear, that no flesh should glory in his presence. There's a reason why our worship is so heartfelt. There's a reason why when we clap, we mean it. 
When we shout, we mean it. There's a reason why when we sing, we put our hearts into it. See, we know what we are. We know what we were like before Jesus found us. We know the reality when we look in the mirror and he still chose us. He still chose us. We understand what a good thing it is uh, to know Jesus. What a good thing it is to be a part of his church. Thank you, Jesus. No flesh, none of us will glory in his presence because all the glory belongs to Jesus. All the glory belongs to God. All the glory is his and his alone forever. You see, when God uses one of us, we can't take the credit. All of the glory is his and his alone. And one of the verses we read the, from Romans, it used the word adoption. And to me, that is such a powerful concept when it comes to our salvation. Adoption is such a powerful idea because adoption is a choice. God gave me three wonderful children. I thank God for them. But I didn't get to go to a menu and pick their hair color or their eye color. I didn't get to pick features they would have, big ears, small ears, big nose, small nose. I didn't, I didn't get to pick any of that. That's what God gave me. And we, my wife and I were so grateful and we rejoiced in his blessings. But we had no choice in the matter. But adoption is a choice. And this is why this is so powerful. Because God looked at you and me. He saw all of our hang-ups, our flaws, our issues, our messes, our problems. He saw all the stuff that we would bring. He saw the junk that we deal with in life. He saw all that stuff that we work through, our emotions and all that stuff. And God said, I still choose him. And I still choose her. Some of you battle condemnation. You need to wipe that condemnation off the board and realize he chose you because he loves you. He chose you because he has a plan for you. He had a choice and he chose you with all the hang-ups and all the issues and all the junk. He chose you. He adopted you and brought you into his family. So we see that God has chosen the weak things and the foolish things and the base things and all this stuff. But then it gets worse. Like, it gets worse. Because not only did he choose the foolish and the weak and the base. But the Bible says, I kind of have it this way in my notes. Not only did he choose a bunch of nobodies. He chose a bunch of bad nobodies. Not only did he choose a bunch of nobodies, he chose a bunch of bad nobodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. These were sins in Paul's day, and he had to address, and they're sins in our day, and we still have to address these things. But verse 11, and such were, what? Such were some of you. You see, not, we weren't just a bunch of nobodies. We got some testimonies in the house today. We weren't just a bunch of nobodies. We were some bad nobodies. And such were some of you, but you were washed. Woo, thank God for the blood. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. How did we baptize you? We baptize you in the name of Jesus. You were sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God, you didn't come to the altar and shake a preacher's hand. You came to the altar and got the Holy Ghost and your life was changed. 
That's what Jesus will do. That's how Jesus builds his church. He takes a bunch of nobodies, a bunch of bad nobodies, and he washes us. He cleanses us. He sanctifies us. He changes us. He saves us. So that's what we are today. Christian Life Center, the great Christian Life Center, is made up of a bunch of words and exes and used to be's. Ex drug addicts, ex drunkards, ex gang members, ex thieves, ex liars, ex cheaters, let's keep going, ex perverts. Whatever was in this world, some of us know that story, but that's not who you are today because you had an encounter with Jesus and now you're an ex. That's what you used to be. Such were some of you, but you've been washed in the blood. You've been filled with the spirit. You've been baptized in the name and you've got a new identity in Christ and now you're in the church I was a freshman in high school I did not have the privilege of going to Stockton Christian School that's what it was called back then now it's we're high society now now it's Stockton Christian Academy I didn't have the privilege I went to public high school and I remember trying to be a light in a dark place and very thankful that the Lord allowed me to bring several friends to church and see them get the Holy Ghost and see God do a great work in their lives, see them get baptized. So grateful for, for that opportunity to be a soul winner in the young years of my life. And I remember in my freshman, my freshman class of, of English, English honors, I'll never forget, I was talking to a friend of mine and just kind of trying to let my light shine. And I made the statement, I said, uh, my dad is an ex-alcoholic. And I was just telling his testimony a little bit. And the teacher, the teacher, I have her name in my notes, but I'm not going to say it over the pulpit. The teacher stopped me. She, <clears throat> <clears throat> Eli, Eli, no, 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 no. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Well, that may be your experience going through the rehab programs of this world. But my dad had a different testimony, just like many of you have a different testimony. Because the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, uh, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't put your label on me once. Always know I'm a new creature. I've been born again. I've been saved. My dance is real. My shout is real. My joy is real. My salvation is real. When you meet Jesus, you get a new identity, a new name, a new future, a new purpose. You're a new creature in Christ. Come on, someone, why don't you celebrate today what Jesus has done for you. Your testimony is real. Your story is real. Your past has no hold on you anymore. We're a bunch of were's, exes, and used to be's. But what we were in our past, that has no hold on us anymore. Can I get a witness today? Can I get a witness today? I wonder if someone would clap. I'm wondering if you lift your voice for a few moments. You're still grateful for what Jesus has done for you. You're still grateful for this Holy Ghost salvation. Ah, woo! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. But I want you to notice this. God's perfect plan for a perfect church doesn't require perfect people. 
In fact, it doesn't even include perfect people. In God's perfect plan, he wants people just like us. See, we know we're not perfect. We know we have issues. We know we have flaws. We know that we've got stuff to work on. But we also know that God hasn't given up on us. He's still working on every single one of us. And we know this today, that we're still on his team in spite of whatever issues we're working through today. We've been adopted into the family of God. But I want you to think about this. Think about this. Let me ask this question. How many of you are on your way to heaven? On Wednesday night, I asked a very similar question. I looked over the audience, and everyone's much closer at West Lane, so I was able to see a little bit better, everyone. And, and shockingly, not everybody raised their hands. So I asked a second time. Not everybody raised their hands. I hope that you've decided to make heaven your home. And I really felt like the Lord wanted me to address this next point in this message. Because even though we have these incredible testimonies of what God has saved us out from, and even though today we are still imperfect creatures, and God's grace is still doing a work in us to make us more like him, even though we've got issues that we are working through today, God wanted me just to remind us about this very important point. That heaven doesn't just let anybody in. If God has saved you out of this world, we need to live a life. You need to live a life free from the sins of this world. What is the whole point of salvation? But to save us and to separate us from all that junk. If I come to church and have a great experience, but I go back and live the same old life I was always living, where is salvation in all of that? But salvation marks a change. Someone said amen. amen. Yeah. Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I am coming quickly. That was spoken 2,000 years ago. If he was coming quickly 2,000 years ago, friend, now's not the time to get distracted. Now's not the time to mess around. I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments. You see, some people have a misunderstanding of God's grace. And they think, well, somehow because I, I'm in the New Testament, somehow because I, I'm following Jesus, somehow because I'm in this covenant of grace, they think it doesn't matter how you live. Hey, friend, there are commandments all throughout this Bible. And there are commandments in the New Testament that apply to those of us who are in the church. And look at what it says. Blessed are those who do his commandments, referring specifically to Jesus, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into that city. How beautiful that day is going to be when we approach the gates. But how horrible it will be if those gates are locked to any of us. Because the only thing that's allowed through those gates are those things that are pure and holy and pleasing in his sight. Someone said amen. amen. Let's keep reading. But outside, everyone say outside. 
are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. And I'm going to read the next verse just so you understand. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Because some people today, I've, I read this passage, some people today have such a misguided view of grace. They think as long as they come down and touch Jesus once in their lives, it doesn't matter how they live. Friend, that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm thankful for your salvation 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, last year, last month, last week. But where is your heart with Jesus today? Are you walking with Jesus today? Are you in love with Jesus today? Have you separated yourself from this world and the sins of this world today? Because here's, here's the point. Even though God has picked us and chosen us and, and, and we a bunch of nobodies, right? And we took it a step further, a bunch of, of bad nobodies. And we've got these, these incredible stories of deliverance. If we go back to what we were. And we go back to the life that we used to live. And we go back and pick up those old sins that we were once saved out of. And we go back like a pig to wallowing in the mire or a dog returns to its vomit. And we go back to what everything Jesus saved us out of. Then, friend, you are no longer qualified to be on this team. And you are no longer qualified to be a citizen of heaven. Why are you talking about this, Brother Lopez? Don't waste the specialness of your testimony. Don't waste the incredible story of grace. Don't waste all the good that God has done in your life. Don't be an Esau that trades something precious for a bowl of soup. Don't you dare trade this great salvation because there's nothing in this world that compares to Jesus. There's nothing in this world that compares to the Holy Ghost. There's nothing in this world that compares to salvation. There's nothing in this world that's better than being in the church. And I promise you this, there's nothing in this world that's better than heaven will one day be. So we need to make up our mind what Jesus has started in me. I'm going to stay the course with Jesus. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. I'm going to keep coming to church. I'm going to keep worshiping God. I'm going to keep serving God. I'm going to keep living for God because the great testimony, the great story that Jesus started, I'm not going to let it end, but I'm going to march all the way to heaven because heaven will be my home. God is good. I said God is good. How do I get there, Brother Lopez? How do I get on God's team? How do I get to be a part of this beautiful thing called the church? You see, if I want heaven to be my home, if I'm caught up in the junk of this world, that means I need Jesus to change me and to set me free from what's holding me back. I need Jesus to give me a new life. I need Jesus to make me that new creation that you are preaching about, Brother Lopez. See, if you need this today, you are in absolutely the right place. Because this is what I know, you can be born again before you walk out of this service today. 
before you make it to your car, you can get that new name and that new identity. You can be a new creature in Christ today before you ever get in your car to drive home, before you walk out these doors. What God has done for so many of us, God can do it for you. And can I get a testimony? Just someone shake your hand, wave your hand in the sky if you will testify. Hey, if God did it for me, he can do it for you. There's no one that's unreachable. There's no one beyond his mercy. There's no one beyond his grace because all throughout this house are testimonies. They thought they had gone too far. They thought they had done too much, but they were in a church service just like this, uh, and they came to an altar just like this, and God changed them just like he's about to change you today. But the Lopez, you make it sound so easy because it is. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That heaven we were talking about, you are not qualified for heaven until you're born again, until you become that new creature. You're not qualified. You can't be on this team. You're not in this church. I'm not talking about a physical location of a church. I'm talking about God's glorious church. You're not in his church until you allow him to change you and to save you. And he tells Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you're not in. You're not in. And Nicodemus doesn't understand. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? What are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean born again? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? I, I, I don't understand your words, Jesus. And Jesus makes it so simple, and I hope I'm making it simple today. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's why in every service we have a baptistry with water ready. That's why in every service we have ministers that are ready to baptize you. Why? Because if you're going to be born again, Jesus said you must be born of water. And we're going to get you in that water, and it's not going to be some religious just ritual you're going to go through. No. But we're going to say in the name of Jesus, and something powerful is going to happen. You're going to go under that water one way and come out completely different. The blood of Jesus is going to wash you clean. You're going to feel something you've never felt before. You're you're going to feel the weight of sin taken off. You're going to raise your hands in that water because you're going to encounter love like you've never experienced before. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. In a few moments, we're going to take an altar call. And we're going to give everyone here the opportunity. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, friend, you don't want to leave today without the Holy Ghost. Wasn't last, last week's service just amazing? Man, I was just loving life as Brother Smith was ministering in the altar service. Just in, absolutely incredible. But friend, that doesn't have to be just one Sunday out of the year. And if you've never received the Spirit of God, my goodness, you can have what Jesus said you could have. Because if you'll be born of the water, and of the Spirit, guess what? You get to be on his team. You get to be a part of this beautiful thing called the church. And one day, one day heaven is going to be your home. Someone said amen. amen. Now, I understand how, how this works. Because you may be here today saying, Brother Lopez, I've experienced all of that. But I know I'm not where I should be today. And I think all of us have probably been there on the journey. We, we've, been, we've had this born-again experience. We, we, we've allowed Jesus to save us and change us. But along the way of the journey, we got distracted. We got discouraged. Life happened. We just kind of lost our way and we let our guard down and we started doing things we knew we shouldn't be doing. We let things back in our life that we knew we, we should not let back into our life. And we made decisions. At the time we knew they were wrong and it just led to more problems. And we found ourselves in this downward spiral of, of making even more bad decisions and having more bad consequences. And, and sometimes we drag into the house of God feeling so defeated and we know there's no one to blame but ourselves. And maybe you've never been there, but I, I know that feeling. I understand that. 
And you could say, Red Lopez, I, I know you're making an altar call today for, for those that need to be born again. But what about me? I'm just, just not where I should be today. Today, God wants to restore you to your place in him. See, he wants you back on his team. 1 Peter 2.25, what a beautiful testimony that some of you are going to have after this service. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's that simple. Don't overcomplicate the salvation message. You must be born of the water and of the spirit. It's that simple. And don't overcomplicate the pathway back to Father's house. All you have to do is return to the one who loves you most, to the one who loves you best. And if you'll have the courage to make a short little journey down an aisle today, what you will encounter in this altar, you're not going to find a God that rejects you. You're not going to find a God that pushes you away. You're not going to find a God that says, you know what, I'm just kind of done with you. No, no, no. You're going to find a God that when you step into this altar, his arms of love are going to wrap around you. His mercy is going to fall all over you again. And there's going to be a work of restoration that happens. And what we just read in 1 Peter, you're going to say, I have returned to the shepherd and overseer. I've come back to Jesus. I've come back to the one who loves me. I've come back to the one that died for me. I've come back to the one that wants the best for me. Would you close your eyes today and, and right where you're at, would you just kind of reach a hand up into this holy atmosphere? I have shared what I felt the Holy Ghost wanted me to share today. Lord Jesus, we love you. In this atmosphere, we know you want to do a great work in the lives of men and women and young people today. And God, I thank you for all that have gathered in this house. And I thank you for what you're about to do. God, I thank you that your mercy endures forever. I thank you, God, that your grace is sufficient. I thank you that the gospel just works. And if we will apply the gospel, if we will obey the gospel, God, we're going to see the fruit of the gospel in this house today. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. I'm going to invite our musicians, our praise team, and they'll be ready to minister in a few moments. After this service, I know our, our home builders ministry, they've got a, a fellowship prepared in the event room, and I'm looking forward to that and just getting to, to hang out with God's family. It's always a beautiful, beautiful time. Fellowship is like, it's amazing, it's priceless that we get to, to be a family here on earth, and one day we're going to be a family together in heaven. It's a beautiful thing. But before we get to the fellowship time, God wants to do a work today. So I'm going to ask a question, and they're going to put it up on the screen. It's simply this question. Who wants to be on God's team? You see, the world may have passed over you. The world may have thought nothing of you. Your family may have dismissed you. They may have put all these labels on you that you're a loser, you're good for nothing, you'll never amount to anything. Yet when God cast his eyes over you, you weren't his last choice. You were his first choice. That's why you're here today. You're here by divine appointment. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm feeling the stirring of the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand, and you're going to be a soul winner today. If you've never experienced this amazing salvation, 
you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, today your story is about to change. You're about to have a dramatic change in your life. And this is about to be the best day of your life. But also, if you need to come back to Father's house, if you need to return to the shepherd and bishop of your soul, if you need to come back to Jesus today in this altar, you're going to find what you've been missing because you know it's not out there. You thought you were going to have fun. You thought you were going to have a good time. You thought you were going to have all that. And you realize it's not what it's cracked up to be. And you've heard me say this a lot. And I think there are many in this house that, that will give me an amen. But your worst day in the church is better than your best day in the world. Give me, give me the church. Give me Jesus. Give me the Holy Ghost. Give me this salvation. Give me the family of God. Mm. Do you feel that? There's an invitation in the Spirit. That's God calling. Everyone, would you raise both hands into this holy atmosphere? If you have the Holy Ghost, I want you to pray in the Spirit right now. You're going to help create the atmosphere for what God's about to do. That's it. Let's keep stirring that up. That's it. Keep praying in the Holy Ghost. God is doing something in the atmosphere. God's doing it in the balcony this morning. It's all over this lower floor. I can feel it. God is stirring. God is moving. God is calling. In the name of Jesus. So I want you to be a soul winner right now. And it may be uncomfortable, but I want you to think about this. Hey, these people are in church. If they didn't want what we're offering, they probably wouldn't be here today. So I want you to find someone and say, do you want what that preacher's talking about? Just find someone. Ask that simple question. You may have known this person most of your life, or it may be a brand new person you're meeting right now for the first time. But I want you to ask, do you want what that preacher's talking about today? If you need salvation, it's here today. We're ready to baptize you. God's going to fill you with his spirit. But if you need to come back, don't feel any shame here today. Because there's about to be a cleansing that's going to take place. And God's going to remove the stain and the guilt of your shame. And he's going to put you back on the right track today. I'm going to give you a few more moments because some of you were really shy. I want you to find somebody. Really, find somebody. Step out of a, 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 your pew. Cross an aisle if you have to. Hey, this is church. Be comfortable. This is your home. Go talk to somebody right now. 
Say, do you want what that preacher has been preaching about the last few moments? And if you find somebody that says, yes, I, I, I want that. I want you to take them by the hand with kindness, with love. And I want you just, you're, you're going to bring them to this altar today. And we're going to see God do a great work in the lives of men and women and young people today. Even children. God's going to do a great work. Beautiful. Come on down. Anybody else? Oh, this is beautiful. Isn't this amazing? Look at what Jesus is doing. Grab them by the hand. Bring them down. Bring them down. Come to the front. Altar team, let's be ready. Pastors, ministers, you know what to do. Let's, let's come down. Awesome. Excellent. We've got some young people right here. It's incredible. Come on now. Come close. Come close. Nothing to be ashamed of. We're getting ready to sing in a few moments. Come close. Come close. Nobody by themselves, but church, we're a church of soul winners. We know what to do. Our altar team, our ministry workers, make sure we're ready. we got going to get cards on everyone because we don't want to lose one soul out of the great harvest that God has given this church. Hey, you know what's happening outside? It's raining. And that got me so excited today. Because Billy Cole said, rain is a sign of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And it's really coming down out there. It's about to be really coming down in here. Woo, hallelujah. Come in close, come in close, come in close, come in close. Bring him down, bring him down. After you pray in the altar, we'll baptize you today if you've never been baptized. But I still feel like the door's open. The invitation is out there. Is anybody else, you need to come back to Jesus today. Don't, don't feel guilt about making this, this journey down here. This is the best decision you'll make is to walk down an aisle to a Pentecostal altar to let Jesus do what he wants to do in your life. Come on down. Mm. Hallelujah. Church, can you just rejoice today for what God's doing? I have decided to follow Jesus. Come on down. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. All right, we sang it through once. Kind of make it a little more comfortable for those. Anybody else want to join us in this altar right now? God's about to do it. God's already touching lives right now. There's children. I need some more soul winners. I need some more prayer warriors to come on down. We can't let anyone be by themselves in this altar. And you know what to do. If they need to repent, lead them through repentance. If they don't understand anything about Jesus, teach them a little Bible study in this altar. And then when it's time, ask them to raise their hands, and God's going to do what only he can do. There are those that are still coming. Come on down. I need some more believers. Can you come help? Maybe you just come stand with someone. Amen. God's doing it today. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided. Church, why don't all of you join us in this altar today? Jesus. Come and be a prayer support for everyone that's down here. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow. Ah! 